my turn. Uh, I'm Gerald Thompson. If some of y'all haven't met y'all before, but uh, I'm not the regular pastor up here, okay? And Brian needs a break every now and then, and we're not even on the same level. So he's like really, really good, and we have uh, can't wait to see, get him back next week. Uh, and I'm also, I noticed on the Teach and Life Together groups, we need to change that slide because Nathan is the teacher. I'm not, he's leading that. I'm, uh, I'm just there. So <laughs> just make sure y'all realize if you come to me, I'm going to guide you straight to him. So uh, it's, been, it's been wonderful. And I, Mark, uh, I'm going I'm to say something here about Mark. I, I hear there's rumors saying that he's going to join our church, which. <laughs> If y'all don't know Mark, yes, if y'all don't know Mark, I mean, if y'all, some of y'all have heard his, his um, message up here, and it's just been wonderful. The Lord speaks loudly through him. We're glad to have him, and can't wait to hear from him, too. So, uh, you did it how many years? How many years was you over it? Oh, yeah, it was amazing, that little white church, a beautiful white church. I, remember, I, I went one time, I wasn't, I was pretty young in my, uh, faith and uh but i went to watch you with brian one time it's, it's that little white church everybody knows that little white church over by best bow there it's just like wow this is amazing it looks like a, the, the best church in the world right there <laughs> just, it is so cool uh, okay let's sorry but let's go to the lord in prayer dear heavenly father we thank you so much for this day thank you for allowing me to get up here you know, i just pray that your spirit will just speak through me um, don't don't let my my stupid opinions come out on my opinions. Just let it be your word, Lord. Let it let it be smooth. Open our ears up. Let us hear what you have to say to us. Um, just thank you so much, and I thank you so much for us being able to welcome our brother Harrison. That's an amazing. Um, that's amazing. It's so wonderful to see a brother come into faith and. Uh, we just can't wait to watch him grow with your word, and uh, we just we're proud of him, and we thank you, Lord. We say this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Yes, welcome, Harrison. Yeah. Let's, let's give him. Let's praise the Lord. Uh, my last sermon I preached about Gideon, who is a member of the Hebrews Hall of Faith. It's sometimes I'll say, actually say fame, but uh, it is, a, is a, everybody knows, a lot of you know that Hebrews 11 is a, a listed of a bunch of members that have done some faithful things during their times. And uh, today I want to talk about another member of the Hall of Faith, and but his name is not mentioned in Hebrews 11, but his faithful experience is listed and that faithful experience is listed as shut the mouths of lions does everybody know who that might be yes daniel that's the, one of the most, most famous stories in the old testament some people could say david and some people could say goliath i mean uh, samson because he you know both of them fought lions <laughs> it's in the bible they fought lions but as we read daniel uh, we definitely see that uh, he shut the mouths of lions. The Lord, the Lord did. The, so uh, I want us to focus. There's some essential elements for us to have this kind of faith in our walk. Because um, Daniel has such a faithful walk. And I want us to focus on three, three elements of that. The first element is Daniel knew God's word. And Daniel obeyed God's word. Did he sin? Yes. Yes, he sinned. Okay, but, but he was overall knew God's word, strongly knew God's word, and he obeyed God's word. Israel and Judah, they didn't have, they didn't have the same Bible we have to learn God's word. But God didn't just leave them hanging out in the middle of, you know, hey, you're my people, you're here, but you just need to know what I'm going to say. No, he gave them the Mosaic law, which had laws and sins and sacrifices. And, but God gave them, also gave them prophets. And these prophets would speak, proclaim God's word. Jeremiah was probably the most famous 
prophet during that time, or the main prophet. Um, and in Jeremiah 27, Jeremiah was prophesying that God was going to turn over Judah to um, Babylon. And told, but told everybody, you will not be harmed if you submit. But if you resisted, you would meet destruction. But there was also some false prophets saying just the opposite. In Jeremiah 27, 14, they were telling Judah, you will not serve the king of Babylon, for they prophesy a lie to you. Now, most theologians had Daniel about 15 years old during this time. So he's a young teenager. Uh, probably, you got to say, probably patriotic, too. I mean, and it, we, as we read later, he was a good, well-built teenager. Um, probably from working hard. He didn't wait, lift weights that day, but they were bulked up from working out and doing hard work and labor. So, and they were just good looking and wise and sharp. We see that later. But, but at 15 years old, it'd be easy to be confused. Wait a minute, I got one prophet saying, God's saying for us to go to Babylon, resist, give up, and because it's a judgment, it's going to be God's wrath. That's God had um, he had prophesied that in the Old Testament. They'd been prophesying that, and it's time, and I need to go with them. But, but, but this other prophet over here, he's saying, no, we won't, we won't do that. Uh, so at this young age, it'd probably be easy to be confused. But so how did Daniel, you know, know which one was real, which one, which way to go? But it's the same as today. We all depend on the Holy Spirit to teach us, to convict us, and guide us through reading God's Word. We must always be concerned, discerning and vigilant when it comes to what we hear and what we believe. We must compare everything with the Word of God and the testimony of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We should always examine the fruits and the motives of those who's teaching us. Uh, that includes me, <laughs> you know. Uh, you, would, you just don't, if I say something that's not against the word, believe me, it was a mistake, so I'm, come to me. Hey, show it to me, because I'm fully with the word. And that's, we have to do that. We have to do that. Um, Daniel, he depended on the Holy Spirit just as we do. Jesus tells us in John 16, 13, the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. 1 John 2, 27 says that the Holy Spirit teaches us all things and is true. Another thing we see, we'll see about Daniel, he was a praying warrior, and we can be rest assured that he prayed for wisdom during his troubles. Daniel was obedient to God, so off to Babylon, this 15-year-old kid went. The second thing I want to see with Daniel's faith was he was committed to wholeheartedly walk with the Lord. Let's open our Bibles up to 1, Daniel 1, starting with verse 3. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of the officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles, youths in him whom was no defect, who were good-looking, shown intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, and who had the ability for serving in the king's court. And he ordered him to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. The king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank, and appointed that they should be educated three years at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. Now among them were the sons of Judah, were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The official, uh, the, the, then the commander of the officials assigned new names to them, and to Daniel he assigned the name Belteshazzar, Hananiah, Shadrach, Mishael, Meshach, and Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel made up his mind. Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank, so he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. We can see 
this 15-year-old was all in from God from the start because he had his mind made he would not defile himself eating clean food. Daniel was led off to Babylon as a slave and probably witnessed execution of anybody that was rebellious. Yet Daniel was not concerned with pleasing the king. He was and he wasn't scared of execution. He was concerned with pleasing God. Most of us have not experienced this type of trial in our lives. Daniel, probably at this point of his life, had not experienced this. He's 15 years old, but he had his mind made up. He, I mean, that's just amazing. But he had his mind made up before he got to Babylon. It wasn't, this wasn't something that, well, let me think about this and I'm going to pray about it. No, he had his mind made up. For us to have that faith, we have to, too, make up our minds. Are we going to wholeheartedly walk with Christ during our hard trials? A lot of Christians in this world really haven't made up their mind, and they're straddling the fence. And those Christians are referred to lukewarm in Revelation 3.16. And we know what Jesus is going to do there. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 24, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Trying to walk with Jesus and the world is like taking a step to God and a step to the world. Now where are you going to go? You know, I'm going to the hospital where I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> we have to follow, Je to follow Jesus. We have to step towards him and walk with him and not look back at the world. You remember that old guy? This, is, this was a really cool story because that old, here a while back I was reading, and uh, man, I remember the old gospel. Um, I decided to follow Jesus. It was, it was like Billy Graham's day. I mean, it was, I remember Mama watching that and, I remember that song. It was like really cool. So, no turning back. Yes. But, so, that song, I was reading this story how it came apart, about. And I was like, this is really cool. This is a cool story. And I got to investigating it and looking at it to see, is this a real? Is this a real story? And uh, it's all over the web. And I just can't believe I had never seen it before. Didn't know this. Even and then I went in, put it in uh, YouTube, and boom, it comes up. The, I was going to show a video, but under some copyright stuff, we wasn't able to do that. But uh, I want to tell you all this story. About 150 years ago, many missionaries came to northeast India to spread the gospel. That area was full of tribes who were primitive and very aggressive hen hunters. These missionaries were not welcome, and most felt or met defeat and death. But one missionary succeeded in converting one tribesman, his wife, and two children. Through him, others in that village began to accept Christianity. Ooh, but this angered the village chief. And he summoned all the villagers together, demanding that the family who had converted them to renounce their faith before them in public or face execution. Moved by the Holy Spirit, the man instantly began saying these words, I've decided to follow Jesus. There is no turning back. No turning back. The chief was enraged and ordered for his two children to be shot down with arrows. As both boys laid dying, the chief asked them, Will you deny your faith now? You've lost both of your children. Next you're going to lose your wife. But the man said these words. Though no one joins me, still I will follow. There's no turning back. No turning back. The chief was angered further and ordered his wife to be shot down before him. And he joined her. She joined her two children in death. May he ask for the last time, I will give you one more opportunity to deny your faith and live. In the face of death, the man sang the final lines, the cross before me, the world behind. There is no turning back. No turning back. The man was shot dead like the rest of the family. But after their deaths, an amazing miracle took place. 
the chief who had ordered the killings was moved by the faith, looking at this dead family, and he wondered, why should this man, his wife, and two children die for a man who lived far away land some 2,000 years ago? The chief realized through the faith of this family and this man that God must be real. This Jesus Christ, who this man was willing to die for, must be real. And on the spot, reports tell us that the chief accepted Christ as his Savior. And throughout the following weeks and months, the rest of the tribes began to accept Christ as their Savior, all because one man and his family were willing to stand up and say, I've decided to follow Jesus, though no one goes with me, the cross before me, the world behind me, and there's no turning back, no turning back. It's an amazing story. Now, Daniel, Daniel didn't know about the cross, but this was his song. He had decided to follow Yahweh, and there was no turning back. Daniel made up his mind to wholeheartedly walk with God before he was taken to Babylon, and there was no turning back. Paraphrasing verses 9 through 20, said, Daniel granted, God Dan, granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commanders. And these officials, Daniel and his friends, looked healthier, better nourished. They excelled in wisdom and understanding and just God gave them all kinds of literature and learning. That's amazing um, how the Lord blesses us. In, in 2 Chronicles 16.9, says, For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. And, okay, because I, I'm, I'm on NASB a lot of the time. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I know the ESV um, is up on the screen. But um, if your heart is completely with God, he's going to strongly support you, and people are going to start noticing that there is something different about you. Daniel 1, 19 through 21 says, The king talked with, with them, and out of them not one was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah. So they entered the king's personal service. As for every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king consulted them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and all the con con conjurers that, that were in his realm. And Daniel continued until the first year of Cyrus the king. He was very, and this was the third king. There's another one yet to come. So there's, well, Cyrus is the fourth king. And he will, God blessed him all through these, these kings. And he had gone through trials to prove that, though. The third element for this faith, Daniel trusted in the Lord with all his heart. Let's turn to chapter 6, Daniel, starting with verse 1. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom. And over them three high officials, of whom Daniel was one of these satraps, would, that these satraps would give account, so that the king might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and the satraps because of an excellent spirit was in him. And the whole, the king was planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Daniel would have been quite a bit older at this time, too. He, uh, some theologians say this, he would have been about 80 years old. But yet, um, he wasn't at allowing his age to slow him down for his love for God. He's in his third king at this point, but God's still allowing him to shine. Reading, when I was reading that, it reminded me of one of my favorite psalms. It's Psalms 92, starting with verse 12 says, the righteous man will flourish like the palm tree. He will grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still yield fruit in old age. They shall be full of sap and very green to declare that the Lord is upright. It, it don't matter the age. And I'm, I'm, as I'm aging, I'm starting to see that and feel that. Our love just grows stronger for the Lord. It's easier to let go of things of the world. 
Um, he, but God allows us to go through tests in life, and we know they're for his glory. It comes a time of learning. It, a lot of times our trials in our life are consequences of what we did. Sometimes they, they're a trial for you or a test and for your walk, to help mature your walk. Generally, a lot of times this walk will cause you to be a thorn in Satan's side. Part of that makeup, made up mind that Daniel had was I'm going to struggle. I'm going to go through some hard times. This ain't going, God's just not going to bless me and just let me just flow on through. I have to make up my mind that these trials are going to happen. Now, how am I going to react? Then the commissioners and satraps began to try to find a group of, a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs. But they could find no accusation or evidence or corruption. Inasmuch as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. People, remember that? People are starting to notice him. They notice him, there's nothing, I mean, he's a good guy, but they're getting jealous. He's a thorn in Satan's side, and people are jealous. They noticed Daniel, but they, and they, but they didn't want Daniel to be successful. Daniel was a righteous man. He did not lie. He cared for others and loved God more than anything. God was allowing Satan to put a target on Daniel's back, and this caused the immortal, immoral satraps to become jealous. Have y'all experienced that in your workplace? Or witnessed this type of jealousy in the world? If you haven't, Mark, at ExxonMobil, get ready. Get your mind made up now. <laughs> um, this, will, this causes gossip, slander, exaggerations, just outright lies. We should have our minds ready because these trials can come at any time in our life. Daniel 6, 5 says, Then these men said, We will not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him in regard to the law of his God. Wow, what a testimony. I mean, no dirt on Daniel. They can't find nothing. They, and they, they were looking. They were watching him. He's not having an affair. He's not stealing stuff. He's not lying to the king. He's not gossiping behind their back. Nobody's heard any stories from him, you know, adding that gospel stuff, gossip. Um, the only way they're going to get Daniel is to find something to do with his relationship with God. It's, wouldn't that be amazing if the Lord could look at us? Uh, I just, I'm like, man, if he could do that with me, that would be so cool. I was just like, because they got some trash on me out there in my past. Uh, then these commissioners and satraps came by agreement to the king and spoke to him as follows. King Darius, live forever. All the commissioners of the kingdom, the perfects and the satraps, the high officials and the governments, governors have consulted together that the king would establish a, a statute and enforce an injunction that anyone who makes a petition to any god or man besides you for 30 days shall be cast in the lion's den. Now, lion's den is a big pit, a big pit with a bunch of hungry lions at the bottom of it. They would keep these um, lions hungry so that they would feed on whoever they dropped in there quickly. And the fall itself probably would take, I mean, it was deep enough for the lions not to be able to jump out. Um, they would also roll a stone over the top so you couldn't climb out. But I'm sure the, the fall itself would probably sprain an ankle or break, break a knee or something. So fighting off the lions is going to be really tough at this time. And, um, but I was reading, I, I just, uh, I started doing some research on a lion. I'm like, you know, what's, what's your chances of fighting off this thing, you know? I mean, what, what, so 600, their bite is 650 pounds per square inch. So the point, I mean, they're sharp, right? The point of that is at best, if he, if he, if he chewed on a rock or something, probably an eighth of an inch. 
650 pounds is going to go through anything it pull, closes in on. Uh, it's going to rip apart your bones, your flesh. And their paws can generate a force up to 1,400 pounds. Mike Tyson ain't got nothing on this, these lines. And we've watched what not Mike Tyson can do with one punch. This had to be a painful and horrific way to go. Up to 120 government officials here, these safe traps, they, you know, they're, that could be some mayors and governors, just all, all high officials. They decided to come to the king with a plan. Now they, they're going to use, notice how they, they're going to approach this. They're going to use the king's ego to, to, to get him to sign that. He says, king, you're so great, right? You, you, deserve, you deserve to be a god for the month. I mean, come on, right? You know, uh, everybody should be praying for you. You deserve that. Um, and if they don't, then we're going to throw them in the lion's den because we're going to clean house of anybody that don't respect you. And so Daniel uh, 6, 8 says, Now, O king, establish this injunction, sign this document, so it may not be changed according to the law of Medes and Persians, which may not be revoked. So signing this law, I mean signing this according to the law of Med Medes and the Persians was, I mean, that, that was it. It was done. It didn't matter. Nobody could revoke that. Even the king himself could not do nothing. So these um, government officials were pretty clever in setting up Daniel. It says in verse 9, Therefore king signed the document that is the injunction. So here they had it. These, uh, these jealous officials were fully in at evil at this time. And God, but remember, God uses these situations for his glory. Daniel 6.10. Now when Daniel, this is so cool. When Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house, now in the roof chamber. He always had, he had his windows open toward Jerusalem, and he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God as he had previously been doing. Nothing's changed. Even though this injunction was in place, after it was signed, and he obviously knew, he was one of the top officials, he was probably there in the signing, and went to his room and prayed like normal. He was still going to worship the Lord with the windows open towards Jerusalem, that's what they did then, back then, where everyone could see. Daniel could have said, today, Lord, I'm going to close the curtains just for a little bit, tear the Block the sun out or something. How many of us might have pulled off the closet rule, right? I mean, hey, Lord, you say go to the closet here. I'm going to go to my closet. But not Daniel. Daniel, in his eyes, closing the windows or the curtains was not an option. Now, there are instances where we run from persecution because of timing. Like when Jesus, he fled situations because it wasn't his time. Or when the disciples... Put, led Paul through a hole in a wall to escape death. It wasn't time, so they, they ran from it. Some Christians have to worship and read the Bible while in hiding. There's nothing, I mean, that happens. We know that. But we have to look into our hearts when we do stuff like this. What, what's, what, what is the motive in our hearts? We should never be ashamed of the gospel. And we should never be ashamed to leave the curtains open Telling the gospel, our glory is to glorify God at all times. We are never to be afraid to die for worshiping Jesus and die for not bowing down to an idol. We should have our minds made up that that ain't going to happen. Even though Daniel knows things are about to get bad for him with this injunction, you don't see that. Daniel ain't going to question the Lord. He didn't say he, Lord, why don't you intervene, please? Lord, why did you let Darius get fooled by these goofballs? No, he prayed thanking the Lord as he previously was doing. He thanked the Lord for the opportunity that was before him. His trust was really similar to Abraham. 
placing Isaac on the altar. Neither Abraham nor Daniel knew exactly how God was going to work their situations, but they both had faith in God. So Daniel thanked God and he praised God because that's what Daniel did. Daniel had an unwavering trust for the Lord. Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. There's no doubt Daniel knew this verse. And he trusted in the Lord with all his heart. And obviously was not leaning on his own understanding. Focusing on his, on our understanding, going to be thrown in the lion's den, you're going to be worried about dying. You're going to be worried about, oh, my, my bones, that's going to hurt. How long is this going to take? Was it, you know, all it's going to do is bring panic, anger, frustration. Nothing good comes out of not trusting in the Lord and leaning on our own understandings. Nothing. Peace and comfort come from not leaning on our understanding, trusting the Lord with all our heart. Even when the worst things are happening, we can have peace. You know, that uncomprehendable peace. You go like, how can I, how can I feel like this during this time? It's amazing, right? Uh, yes, it is. Amen, brother. Uh, these men, in verse 11, these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and supplication before God. These guys knew this was easy, going to be easy to prove. Uh, they knew exactly when Daniel prayed. They knew exactly what he was doing, and when he was doing it, it was. Uh, so there's a, there's several witnesses, right? We don't say how many of these say traps, but I'll bet you he says 120. I bet it's probably close to that, 120. Um, but first, first they want to they want to make sure this. Let's go back to the King. Make sure he realizes what he did, right? They approached the king and spoke to the king about the king's injunction. Did you not sign an injunction that any man who makes a petition or to any god or man besides you, O king, for 30 days is to be cast in a lion's den? Let's get to the, hey, you signed that, right? The king replied, the statement is true according to of the Medes and Persians, which may not be revoked. Now they're going to drop the bomb on Daniel. Then they answered and spoke before the king, Daniel, who is one of those exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you or to the injunction which you sign, but keeps his petition three times a day. Then as soon as the king heard this statement, he was deeply distressed and set his mind on delivering Daniel. And even until sunset, he kept exerting himself to rescue him. So you have these conspirators sitting there wanting to, uh, they got their stuff together. They got all their evidence. They got all the people, um, witnesses lined up there. King's already said, you know, yes, I did sign that. It it cannot be revoked. Um, But there's no doubt the king loved Daniel. There's no doubt. Um, But notice these, all these, all these satraps, um, Government officials, they, they uh, call him an exile from Judah. So there was probably some um, thinking there, you know, look, hey, we're, we were born in Babylon. That guy was born over that trashy Judah area and should not be over us. Then these men came by agreement, verse 15, they came by agreement to the king and said, the king, recognize, O king, that it is the law of Medes and Persians and no injunction or statute which the king establishes may be changed. Seeing that the, we we see that he had compassion, man, but they're still, they're like, you can't, because they saw it, they saw it, man, he might have been tearing up. He's like, no, king, you cannot change that. You know, you can't change it. Verse 16, then the Lord gave orders, and Daniel was brought in and cast into the lion's den. The king spoke, said to Daniel, your God whom you constantly serve will himself deliver you. The king was obviously had been getting developing some faith in the Lord because he probably witnessed several times God's power through Daniel. So he knew something was obviously going on, but he was still he was still scared. He was still worried. Um, 
And he probably at this time he's seeing I was set up. They, they kind of set me up. They knew I loved Daniel, and they just knew. I, I, this, he probably getting anger in his heart. Um, a stone was brought and laid over the mouth of the den. Now Daniel cannot climb out. Probably hear a bunch of uh, lions roaring or something. I mean, it, probably when they when they do drop somebody in there and them hungry lions do attack them, it's probably a lot of screaming and stuff going on. I, I don't picture Daniel was screaming, but there was probably a lot of roaring of lions and stuff. And uh, the king sealed it with his own signet ring, and and uh, so that nothing could be changed in regard to Daniel. The king went off to his palace and spent. The night fasting and no entertainment was brought before him, and his sleep fed from him. Doesn't it say exactly if the Lord, I mean, if the king was praying to the Lord, but he was fasting. And uh, one could believe that the king was starting to see the light, and we know by the end of it he does. Daniel 6.19 says, The king arose at dawn and to break of day and went to haste to the lion's den. When he, when he came near the den, he cried out to, in a troubled voice. And he said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, probably in tears, just, has your God whom you constantly serve been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel spoke to the king, O king, Live forever. My, my God sent an angel and shut the mouth, lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me. Inasmuch as I was found innocent before him, and also towards you, O king, I have committed no crime. Then the king was very pleased and gave him, uh, orders for Daniel to be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken out of the den, and no injury whatsoever was found on him, not one scratch, because... He had trusted in the Lord. Some children's books, you know, show Daniel sleeping with the lions and using them for pillows and stuff. And that, that actually may be true because Daniel was probably refreshed and had some, he's like, man, I, I'm good, bro. I'm good. I had a good night's sleep. The king was suffering all night. Daniel 6, 25, then the king, then Darius the king wrote to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language who were living in all the land. May your peace abound. I make a decree that in all the dominion of my kingdom, men who are able to fear and tremble before God, are, in all the dominion of my kingdom, men are to fear God and tremble before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed and his dominion will be forever. He delivers and rescues and performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? <laughs> yes. So this Daniel enjoyed success in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus, of the Persian. Now we know, this is amazing. And, and the amazing part is the king got to witness this. So he's definitely like, Wow, this, is, this God is real. Now, we know that not all faith stories are like Daniel's. But we know that they are delivered. Isaiah the prophet, he didn't have a story like this. They actually cut him in two. Daniel had his, I mean, Paul had his head cut off. James was put to death with the sword. Peter was crucified upside down. The family and I decided to follow Jesus, was shot down with arrows. Some people die for their faith. We know that. But they're still delivered. Paul wrote in his letter on his, right before he was to be executed, in his last letter, towards the end of it, to 2 Timothy, it's 2 Timothy 4.18. The Lord will deliver me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. In closing, I want us to see, Daniel was an ordinary man and God used him to show his glory. God may use us one day to be like Daniel. We should be praying for strong faith. 
We should be praying to have a wholehearted walk, to be obedient when the time of the test, and we should be praying to be able to trust in the Lord with all our hearts. We are, let, we are to make up our minds right now. How are we going to react if we are in face, we face death by worshiping our Jesus Christ? We need to decide we're going to follow Jesus and not turn back. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we um, thank you for this story of David. Thank you for letting us see what a 15-year-old can have, especially on a day that we see a young baptism. We know he's coming up in the world. And we thank you for allowing us to see that. And we thank you for allowing us to see what faith will bring. We thank you for allowing us to pray for faith. We thank you for allowing us to trust in you. And we pray that we open our hearts up and we do trust in you. I know there's situations in our lives sometimes we don't, we don't do that. And I'm the, one of the worst. When I look off and get angry about something, I'm not trusting in you. I'm going through some times right now with uh, my mother's situation, and I'm seeing that trusting in you is the only way. It is the only way, and we thank you for that, Lord. I just pray and um, ask that you will lead us all to trust in you more and not uh, look at our own understanding, look at the situation, and this is the way it always is. And we know that you are in control. We thank you. We praise you, Lord. We thank you for everything. We say this in your precious love, Jesus. Amen.